Jeff Pelly, a 17-year-old who allegedly murdered his entire family in cold blood and went to Palm right after the incident. Although the evidence against Jeff Pelly was eventually lacking, including forensic evidence, the murder weapon, and witnesses who may have linked him to the crime, Pelly was found guilty in a trial that took place 17 years after the incident. So, are you ready to know more about him? Well, in this video, we'll share with you the untold story of this boy who killed everyone just for this. On April 30, 1989, parishioners of the Olive Branch Church waited anxiously for their service to begin, but their Reverend Robert Pelly did not appear. Even members of his family were not present at the church. After visiting next door to check on the family, churchgoers discovered the pastor, his wife, and their two kids lying in a pool of blood inside their home. All four had just been shot. The disappearance of the Reverend's allegedly troublesome son, Jeff Pelly, who was 17 years old, was reported by the Indiana State Police as soon as it occurred. The young man had been arrested for a burglary only a few short weeks previously, and as a consequence, his father had forbade him from attending the senior prom. This seemed to the police like a possible explanation for why the crime was committed, and Jeff Pelly quickly became their prime suspect. The following day, the cops found him at an amusement park and learned that the night before, he had dressed to the nines for prom with his pals and then partied irresponsibly with them. It was finally determined that he was responsible for the deaths of four members of his family, and he was found guilty of the crimes. Nevertheless, there is still some debate as to whether or not he had committed them. This is the upsetting tale that he told. Robert Jeffrey Pelly, who was born on December 10, 1971, comes from a very devout family. The 1960s saw his father and mother, Ava, meeting each other for the first time at Mount Vernon Nazarene University in Ohio. They were married in 1970, and Pelly was born in the following year in 1971. 1976 was the year when his youngest sister, Jacques, entered the world. In 1980, although his father's religion was the center of his life, the guy was successful in landing a job programming computers. Because of the chance, they found themselves in Cape Coral, Florida, which is where Ava Pelly received the news that she had skin cancer in 1984. After declining medical care, she passed away in February of the following year. Within a few short months, Robert Pelly became acquainted with Don Huber. The 27-year-old woman had only just experienced the loss of a husband herself, and the two widowers fell in love with one another very fast, because they were married so quickly in November 1985. Jeff and Jacques were forced to meet their new stepsisters shortly after the wedding. In 1986, the newly formed Pelly family relocated to Lakeville, Indiana. At the time of their arrival, Jessica was five years old, Janelle was four years old, and Jolene was only two years old. Hooper's other three kids were Janelle, Jessica, and Jolene, while Robert Pelly was serving as the pastor of the Olive Branch Church, which had a congregation of up to 50 people. Conditions at home were far less tranquil. Mark Center, a detective with the Indiana State Police, observed, I know there was a lot of animosity in that family between him and his dad, between Bob and Jeff. I'm aware of the circumstance in which Bob hit him once. I believe that a lot of the same stuff was seen by the neighbors as well. Despite this, the Pelly family had a peaceful existence at the parsonage that was located right next door to the church until the beginning of 1989, when Jeff Pelly was taken into custody for the theft of CDs and cash from a neighboring residence. Center had been involved with the investigation personally. According to Center, Bob Pelly put Jeff on an administrative leave for the burglary case. Pelly's prom was a two-day event that began with a customary dance on Saturday, April 29, and concluded with a school-sponsored expedition to the Great America Amusement Park on Sunday, April 30. This was a significant event for Pelly, whose prom was a two-day affair. Center postulated that Pelly was crushed when his father disallowed him from going, and that this led to Pelly's violent attitude to the situation as a result. Center said that Jeff Pelly had only gone to the prom after he had already murdered his biological father, stepmother, and two of his stepsisters. David Hathaway, a member of the congregation, was the one who stumbled into the murder scene after the pastor's absence from the Sunday service at 9.30 in the morning. Hathaway looked about for a key and entered the building when his knocking remained unanswered. After finding the pastor's spectacles on the ground, he subsequently found the body of the pastor. Don Pelly was discovered dead by the local police, embracing both of her deceased children. Santa reflected on the events of that morning and said, No one should have witnessed what we saw. It didn't seem to be a burglary at all. It did not appear like a home invasion. That morning, I was a detective, so I witnessed the worst of the worst. But we had to keep moving on with the investigation. Therefore, we quickly began discussing possible culprits. Since Jacques, Jessica, and Jeff Pelly all managed to escape the carnage, the detectives verified their alibi. 
While Jessica stayed the night at her friend's house for a sleepover, Jacques had traveled out of town to see a college acquaintance. However, Jeff had been in town the whole time, and he was visibly upset with his father. Sander came to the following conclusion. I assume he murdered his family and then was allowed to go to the prom. After finding Jeff Pelly at the amusement park on April 30, the maddening investigation police interrogated him at the station while he was accompanied by his grandparents. The interrogation took place on April 30. When questioned about his stepmother, he responded as follows. We didn't get along pretty well. I suppose we exchanged pleasantries like hello and goodbye. But other than that, we never actually conversed with one another about anything else. I don't mean that I disliked her or anything like that, but the two of us just tolerated one another. However, since there was neither a murder weapon, nor any forensic evidence, nor any eyewitnesses, the case against Pelly was fairly weak. A sequence of events and circumstantial evidence were the only two pieces of evidence that the St. Joseph County detective, John Bodick, used in his investigation. He said that quite a few individuals had visited the Pelly residence on Saturday, and that they had stayed until 5 p.m. to display their prom attire. After then, there were no more guests in the home, and by 5.30, Jeff Pelly's 1984 gray Ford Mustang had already been taken away. According to Frank Schaefer, an assistant district attorney for St. Joseph's County, there was a very, very tiny window when the family might have been killed, and it was very evident that the only person who could have done this was Jeff. This statement was made by Mr. Schaffer. The idea that Schaffer proposed went as follows. After using the shotgun that belonged to the family to murder the four people, Pelly concealed the gun and the shells that it contained. After that, he cleaned his trousers, got a shower, got dressed, and then went to the home of a buddy to pick up his girlfriend for the prom. But up until the year 2002, there just wasn't enough evidence to prosecute him with anything. At the time that he was accused of the prom night killings, Jeff Pelly had just started a family. He resided in Florida and he worked as a consultant for IBM. Yet, he was now facing allegations of four separate murders. His trial started in 2006, and the prosecution has been depending on the chronology they created in 1989 ever since it began. The defense team thought that was a ridiculous argument. The individuals who were with Jeff that night characterized him as simply one of the group, and they were having a wonderful time, according to the defense counsel, Alan Baum. From all indications, the folks who were with Jeff that night portrayed him as just one of the group. It seems so ludicrous to believe that he could have spent the whole evening doing all that they did and having fun like a child after having just murdered his family. Yet the thought persists. In 2006, a jury convicted Pelly guilty of all charges, and he was given a sentence of 160 years in prison. When the Indiana Supreme Court affirmed in 2009, Pelly's conviction was finalized in 2009. A few years later, however, Francis Watson of the McKinney Wrongful Conviction Clinic submitted a post-conviction relief application on the defendant's behalf. Her argument for a new trial was based on the results of a luminol test that was conducted in 1989 on the cylinder of Pelly's washing machine. This test, however, had not determined whether there had been blood or even laundry detergent in the machine on the day in question to demonstrate whether he attempted to clean his bloodied clothes. She said that the accusation that Pelly had cleaned his pants had unfairly affected the jurors who heard the case against him because of this. In addition, a peculiar transcript was never submitted as part of the evidence. In 2003, prosecutors interviewed a lady whose name was Tony Beeler. During the interview, she discussed Robert Pelly's questionable financial activities in the state of Florida. She said that he was terrified of being killed by his customers, who she did not identify. However, more material on this claim has not yet been uncovered. As of right now, Jeff Pelly is still doing time in prison for the 1989 killings of four members of his family when he was only a teenager. The evidentiary hearing for him is set to take place in the middle of March 2022. So that concludes our video. Please share with us in the comments below. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it and make sure to subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. See you with the next one. Until then, peace.